And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the water cooler chat that Denny and I are going to be hosting here today. My name is Jonathan Risto. I'm one of SANS instructor and one of the co-authors for the Management 516 class, uh, the Managing Security Vulnerabilities Enterprise in Cloud. So we're going to pass it over to Denny. You can do a br brief thing for him, and then we'll come back in and dive right into this survey. Hey, Jonathan, thank you for that. Uh, introduce myself. My name is Christopher Denny. I'm an associate instructor with SANS, and I'm working with Jonathan on teaching management 516, vulnerability management, enterprise, and cloud. Um, I've learned as much from Jonathan and the other course author, David, as anyone could expect. And each time we, we run the class, I learn just as much from the students as hopefully they learn from us. So with that, I want to kick it back over to Jonathan and grab my water for the water cooler talk, and we'll kick it off. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my water right here. Thanks, Denny, for that. What we did here is um, we put together a quick short survey. It was three questions we asked out there, just trying to understand what some of the problems you're having in vulnerability management. We had some very specific questions we asked out, and we're going to try and address some of those comments that came back, the general feedback, and some general commentary in regards to the survey itself. So that's what we're going to do here today. Don't need to dive into what the questions are right now. We'll, those will come up over the course of the day. We've got about an hour book, so let's just get in because there are all kinds of great information that was provided to us by the respondents here. So I appreciate everyone having taken the time to do that. And what we actually saw, and just a quick summary of things, was we saw about I think it was on the first question about the challenges, we actually saw about 175 responses that came in related to the answers that have been out there. So there's a good sampling of what we have from people that came in. So, and it's similar for the other questions across the, uh, that we put out there. So thank you for uh, responding back in. But uh, one of the issues that we're seeing right now, and I'm gonna ask Denny a question on this, is like, it seems time is actually one of the problems everyone keeps commenting about. That's one of their biggest challenges they have, like in response to one of our first questions. So we just don't have enough to time to deal with vulnerability remediation. How can we make some more time in our environment, Denny? What do you think? What suggestions do you have for people of how they could actually deal with that? getting more time to get remediation work done. So time is one of those resources that everybody tries to, to you know, finagle, to, to wrangle in, and to make more of. Quite simply, we're, we have a finite amount of time to do X amount of uh, project work and remediation work and all the other work that keeps getting piled on us. Um, but I want to relate this in kind of a story manner. So as I was growing up, I worked for two different uh, contractors, two different builders, two different guys that were both, both craftsmen in what they did. They were, you know, typical contractors. They would show up, you know, actually a non-typical because they would both show up on time, but they both did great work and they were both really good at what they did. But there was two biggest, two big distinctions between the two of them. So the first contractor, he would tell you he'd be there on Tuesday. Come Tuesday, he'd call you and tell you he'd be there on Wednesday. Come Wednesday, I'll be there next week because his jobs kept running over. He kept, he kept getting in his own way. He kept having to fight against his own, his own processes. So he was never able to get a good head of steam. Although he was a great contractor, he was a great craftsman and did great work, he always kept falling behind. He kept falling behind. The second contractor, he worked Monday through Thursday on his project work. And every Friday was devoted to scoping out other jobs. So he would work 10-hour days Monday through Thursday, but on Friday he would set time aside to go, you know, and scope out other jobs, to go quote and bid other other um, other jobs coming up, and the difference I found between the two is one was reactive, and one was proactive. So the reactive one was always fighting the fires, always dealing with what came up next, always having to address the issues. Where the proactive contractor, he actually set time aside and tried to plan out his activities, and of course he still ran into those hiccups and those fires, but he had time set aside to deal with those. So I tell you that story to kind of relate it back to the vulnerability management and you know where, where are we going to find this time? We can either choose to be reactive to it and fight those vulnerabilities as they come up and the next name vulnerability, we're scrambling to see what's going to happen and we're scrambling to put our defenses in place and put our detections in place. Or we can take a more proactive approach to it where we have to set time aside to address vulnerabilities on a routine and regular basis. Yeah. It's going to be hard when we first get started to make that routine and regular basis occur. But once we do that, we're going to find that it takes less and less of our time and it will actually create time in our schedules and allow for other work to take place. 
but we've got to be able to set that time aside. No, totally agree with you there, Denny. If we can get the time set aside for what's going on. And one of the things, if we can, it's ideally we want to get it so the machine is able to run inside your organization, like the, the patch management, change management processes are all running and we're starting to look at it just from what the outliers are. But that's more of a mature organization. It's how do we get to that point? And I agree, setting the time aside, making it so it is a, a standard task for everybody as opposed to being like the, it's, as we know, those secondary and tertiary duties as assigned um, are always fun for us to have. And vulnerability management often ends up into that bucket for some reason. And so it ends up being, oh, best effort, go get help Jonathan get things done when he comes and asks you for it. And so you seem to be taking tasks and time away from what it is really supposed to be their primary focus. We've got to get the time assigned so vulnerability management and the remediation efforts become part of that primary focus for people. And that's hard to do. Like Denny said, it's it's a hard mentality for us to change. But if we're able to do that and make it so, uh, let's just give an example. Say we can actually get the agreement from some of our system administrators, the management team there, that for remediation effort, we want a 10% slice of their time. Let's just argue that. So it's like, it becomes a primary duty. We have that 10%. So the four hours a week worth of effort work that we can have, that's half a day that we can have them focusing on remediation efforts. So if we can get that in there, it's gonna, as Denny said, allow us to ensure the work is getting done. But I also think, and I, I tend to find when someone has a, a time slot against it, they're also going to be measured on the effectiveness of it. So it's going to be part of their performance review potentially, or at least you're going to be offering feedback and input into the performance review because it's a primary duty as opposed to we're never really measured on those secondary and tertiary things. It's those three or four main duties we have to worry about. So it's a way we might be able to juggle it in for us. No, that's, that's great feedback on that one, Jonathan. Um, you mentioned the survey that we put out earlier, and it was yeah. you know, several questions. And I know we crunched numbers, but what was the biggest surprise that came out of that survey? Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, probably should have started here. But uh, regardless, <laughs> what we had, we, we did have the three questions we asked out. And I don't know if there was one single surprise that came out from the results. It was more along the line of there's not one single problem that all of our organizations are facing. Like if we were taking take a look at the first question that we asked, which was related to challenges. Um, I have the data sitting here right here in front of me on my other screen. It's like we had a roughly, what would it be here? Um, yeah, 20% of the respondents said they were having problems with uh, the lack of the metrics in their environments. Other ones said it was how to actually find the find, how to find the results that they need, like to resolve them as we just talked about. And the other one was like asset inventory. So it's like there was, but they're all about the same. And the same with question number two, if we, when we were taking out what kind of metrics are the best things for in your environment, there wasn't a single winner. So it was, again, there's multiple responses of what people are finding useful. And we'll dive into the metrics in a second. I'm sure we're going to, well, I know we're going to get there. And the same thing with threat intelligence. Where are we gathering it? It's not just one spot. We see it coming in from everything from blog posts, coming in out of our product data. It's coming from our scanners themselves. So not just threat intelligence, but even just the basic scanners that have it. So the surprise in essence, or almost reaffirming some of the points on find and vulnerability management is that it's not just one thing that everybody has as the problem. It's a, in some organizations that say it's asset management. Other ones that how do I get the remediation effort done? So other ones, I don't have good metrics. And it's, it's interesting to see that that is the case I found purely from the standpoint of, with the survey. It's like, hey, how do I make this work? And I don't, it's not a silver bullet solution. It's common, it's similar problems that a lot of people are actually having, which I find interesting. Do you think that has to do with the maturity of the organization, the different, uh, the, oh. the, on the differences, or is it just one of those things that just kind of weaves its way through? I think the maturity does end up coming into play because if you're, let's pick on a, like a large organization, the 50, 60, 70,000 people, they, they are definitely out there. I, I work in one right now. 
but it, and there's lots that do have the mature program. They've been around for a while, or they've been forced to go more mature on vulnerability management because of regulatory requirements, or even just the industry they work in. Let's argue like um, like defense base as an example. It tends to be a lot more pressure and requirements to be in compliance. So those organizations tend to be more advanced, but they still have challenges. We see that. I've had people in the class coming in, trying to get better information to improve their program that are coming from the big companies out there. And then we also have the extreme other side of that, instead of the really mature program, you have the companies that are still just starting out to figure out and implement vulnerability management. Like you, both ends of those extremes really does play into where some of the challenges are. I think more mature organizations, uh, giving the example on asset management, they might have some more sophisticated processes and tooling in place to help them there compared to an organization that's just starting out that ah, ah, a deer in headlight kind of look, I don't know what to do. We've got a spreadsheet that we had from three years ago. Is that gonna work? Kind of situations is what we end up with. So I do think that it ends up being a, um, a directly tied in essence where our problems tend to come in with the maturity. Some of the people might say like metrics, oh yeah, I got tons of metrics, I don't have to worry about it. But it's others might be, I haven't even thought about how to do metrics yet. So I think it all, it, it does some tie back to the maturity aspects. I don't know, from your side, did you have any surprises, Denny, that you saw? No, I kind of looked at it like you did. Uh, when we broke down the data, it was kind of one of those threads that, you know, it wasn't any any one glaring issue. Um, we have talked about some of the stuff in class where, you know, different organizations come in with their different challenges. And I've seen organizations of similar size have two totally different challenges. You know, they may come in with the metrics issue saying they don't know what the right metrics are or how to report that up to their program managers or their executive level. And other organizations are trying to get their arms wrapped around, you know, the asset management aspects of it, not being able to uh, identify what they have in their organizations. So you're right. The maturity does play a part in it. The size of the organization plays a part in it, but it also, you know, where are you in your vulnerability management program overall plays a part in it because you could be a large organization with an immature vulnerability management program, or you could be a small to medium business with a very mature vulnerability management program. Yeah. Both of those are going to, are going to present their own challenges. Yeah, I, I'd agree. It's, it's not just the big organizations that are mature, but it also, I find within vulnerability management, the companies that I've seen, it's the problem with vulnerability management in general, um, I'll expand a little bit the scope here is we're responsible for getting the vulnerabilities remediated, but we're not responsible for the all of the processes that we look at end to end because we leverage change management. Oh, wait, I don't want to be the owner of change management. Never, ever, ever. Uh, <laughs> not my forte, not what I want to do, but I've got to really understand and use it in order to make it work to get the remediation efforts done. Like we want to take advantage of lots of processes, change, patch, config management, um, asset inventory. Mind you, we're probably gonna end up driving the asset inventory and security in general, probably in the vulnerability management side to make sure it gets there. But it's leveraging all of those other parts of the organization that we could be mature, but ah, I just brought in change management, just came in and we're just getting up to speed. So it's that that's the challenge I end up, I see and I've, fought that and dealt with it internally in the organizations as well of just eh. we can't we don't own everything we can't see everything going on and i've got to wait and rely on other people some of it goes back to your remediation comment we just had it's like i need other people to do the remediation efforts probably 90 percent of the companies that are out there i don't have control over those individuals doing it but yet i measured on their performance really frustrating unless you have some great collaboration and working relationships with all the teams we need to interface with. And you're right, that can be frustrating from a vulnerability management standpoint. If you're the one having to you know, run your scanners and run the, run the program and, and feed this information to your remediation teams, and you're seeing the same results over and over and over again, and you're not, you don't feel like you're making progress, it can be very frustrating at the end of the day. But then you get that one day where that that zero vulnerability comes out or that that um, that one major vulnerability comes out and you're protected against it because people would actually remediate it, what you had laid out for them to remediate. 
those days seem to be very, you know, very successful. Those days make you feel really good about what you do. But yeah. there's those other days where you hand that information off and then the next cycle comes around and you hand the same information off plus a little bit more. And then the third cycle comes around and it's the same information again. You just kind of get beat down a little bit. Yeah. But it's it's no. a good fight and it's a fight we need to keep fighting. Yeah, agreed. It is there. And if anyone does have comments, please feel free. You can post it out. We do see the comments coming up. Or if you have specific questions, feel free to put that out from the live stream, how you're coming in. If you have the ability to do that, we'll see if we can get addressing to those. I've seen some folks saying hi, et cetera. But um, yeah, it's, if you have questions, we'll see what we can do to try and make sure we address those as we're looking at some of the topics. Or if you have extra points that you'd like to add in, please feel free to do that. Now I'm gonna pick on Denny again, though, kind of tying back to what you were just talking about with the remediation and sending the stuff over and over again. But it's um like we get the results out of our scanners and these they really can be overwhelming. I've seen organizations with millions of vulnerabilities out there. Like how do we start breaking this down? How, how can people that are listening, what can we do to help make life a little easier instead of, oh my God, I have 10 million vulnerabilities out there, what do I do? How can we break it down? What do we have? How can we start and make that work for them? What do you have for suggestions there? Well, the first thing is let's not crawl up in a ball in a corner of our cube. That's that's <laughs> not where we're going to end up. <laughs> Run and hide. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we've all seen those reports come out of that very first vulnerability scanner, and it's almost like a sticker shock, shell shock. And like you said, you see thousands upon thousands upon millions of different vulnerabilities. Where do you start? You know, well, like the old adage says, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. So mm -hmm. you've got to find a good place to start. And for some of us, it's going to be looking at vulnerability centric. And that's just taking the numbers and seeing, okay, what's my most critical? Whether it's based upon the, uh, the CVS scores or the criticality scores assigned by the, by the various scanner, start there. It's a start. You know, you've got to take that, that, that journey of a thousand steps or a thousand miles starts with one step. So that may be just looking at the number or just the vulnerabilities and you tackle the largest vulnerability that's out there, whatever that may be for your environment. Um, you could do some basic threat analysis. Could look at it and say, okay, where are my, you know, where, where is uh, the, the highest concentration of vulnerabilities in my environment? Maybe we start focusing there. It, again, it's a strategy. We want to find a strategy that works for us in our environments. Um, if we are a, a digital company that has a very high or very large public uh, footprint, maybe you want to start with your DMZ segments. Maybe you want to start with your publicly facing segments. If you're a company that gets targeted a lot by ransomware, phishing attacks, they keep going after your CFOs, your COOs, your C-level employees. Maybe we identify those assets or those individuals and start there, get their systems up and protected the best we can. You know, all those are different methods. All those are different methods of, of um, addressing those overwhelming numbers. Sometimes you just start at the top of the list and work down if that's all you've got. And yeah, hopefully nope. we're not working off spreadsheets. You know, the, the, <laughs> the worst thing we do is get off the spreadsheets. Um, I've seen that in organizations before where they run the numbers and hand a spreadsheet over to their remediation teams, and they look at the spreadsheet and go, "What is this?" You know, like that's what you need to fix this quarter, and that's a, that's a horrible cycle to begin. So when we when we look at these numbers, we want to be able to put it into into a context and give it to them. Say, hey, here, you know, instead of addressing these 30, 40, 50,000 vulnerabilities, hey, go out and apply, you know, the latest Microsoft patch to your Windows 10 systems. That'll knock you down by 30 percent. That's something you can get your arms around. That's something that can really you, know, you can sink your teeth into. You know, um, maybe you say, hey, address the latest Adobe vulnerability by you know updating all of our Adobe to the latest versions. Okay, again, that's a start. That's somewhere to go. That's somewhere to, something to sink your teeth into and give your remediation teams something tangible to work on versus, hey, here's the 30,000 Adobe vulnerabilities over your 800 systems. Yeah. Pure nope, math can just be uh, under, overwhelming. Yeah, it's, I agree. It is it's overwhelming from some aspects there. And as you said, it's how can I break that data up? So let's argue I've got 100,000 vulnerabilities and that may be small for some people. There are organizations that have million, million and a half vulnerabilities that are getting reported. Yes, there are larger companies, say, but they've got lots of individual subsidiaries, et cetera, but they are out there. It's not uncommon. I hear this regularly and I've seen it inside organizations. But it's like you said, Chris, it's like, how do you get it to break up 
and get it into a manageable chunk. That's what we have to try and figure out to do. And as Denny said there as well, it's like, hey, can I do it by, let's start with prioritization. That's where we all tend to start when we've been dealing with vulnerability management. It's like, okay, I work with the CVSS score 10 items. That may be all that we have available for us to work on, but at least start breaking it up into the manageable chunks. And that's what we tend to do as we're maturing our programs. As, as Denny said, we layer in, okay, well, what about threat intelligence? Is there, as an example, is there an exploit available? Now maybe that becomes more important. Or the other example it was given with regards to, is it because I wanna focus on my external facing devices that are out there in the DMZ? That's breaking it up into a smaller chunk and then working there. We can look at it from our data. Where is our most important data? What do we have to worry about protecting if you wanted to go that route? But it's how can I chop and slice the data up so then I can pass it off to the remediation partners. We do need to some method to break it up because that deer in headlights, 100,000 vulnerabilities is just overwhelming. And as Denny said at the start, let's not go and hide in the corner because it just drives you so crazy. But I also think it, some of it is going to come into, I guess I'll put this as a next question for you here, Denny, as well, with regards to the remediation how do and general vulnerability management. Like, how can we really get them to get the attention we need? We talked a little bit about remediation, but what can we do to try and make it so we're listened to or treated as important as some of the other parts of the organization? So it's how can we make it work for us? Any thoughts or comments on how we can uh, improve and get more attention on the vulnerability management side, which was one of the other challenges people were commenting about. So John, a quick aside, I just wanna make sure you can still hear me and see me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Unfortunately, my headset died right in the middle of all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can still hear you fine. All right. I'll Sound see a little minutes. different, but uh, th that's okay. Okay. So if you don't mind repeating the question for me, because I had the beeping in my ear while I was trying to troubleshoot that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I love it. All the toys of life. When things go wrong, they go wrong. Oh, yeah. uh, I, was, I was just tying back into with our, um, because we were talking about remediation and trying to get the work done. And because we were breaking it up into manageable chunks, but even how do we get vulnerability management to get the attention from inside our organization compared to all of the other processes, programs that we have out there? How do we make sure, or what are some options people can do to try and address that challenge of getting access and make, showing that vulnerability management is important inside the organization? Like some of the other areas, pick on change or whatever, or the, even the business processes and business units out there. Any thoughts or suggestions you can have for people to help them with that challenge? So sure. Um, one of the first things is going to sound kind of odd, but you got to be your own, you got to be your own cheerleader. You've got to be the one to tout the successes and the you know uh, how your vulnerability management program is doing. And in order to do that, it's not necessarily always you know being the one to point out all the issues and all the vulnerabilities. Tout the successes of those that are doing the remediation, those that are doing technically doing the work for you. Because, yeah, it's easy for us to go through it as vulnerability management teams and point out all of the so-called shortcomings of all of our other teams, of our server teams, of our workstation teams, of our database teams. We don't want to be seen as the, as the naysayers. Mm -hmm. let's, let's go out there and let, let's you know, support them and show, hey, the server team just addressed you know, vulnerabilities that, that decreased their overall risk score by X amount of percentage. And if you can be that cheerleader and get that information pushed up and pushed out, it can show value in your vulnerability management programs. It can show that they're, you're actually gaining traction against this mammoth, uh, an overwhelming amount of data. Um, another solution could be tell a story, put things in context. I'm sure this week there's been a, a vulnerability that's hit the papers or hit the news and next week there'll be another one. And last week there was another one. And There'll be another named vulnerability coming out soon. Just keep watching the news and you'll see it. Get out in front of it in your organizations, especially with your executives. Never discredit the executives. They may be the high levels and they may not be technical. But one thing executives do understand is risk and they understand bottom line. So if you can take that latest vulnerability and put it into a context and tell a story to your executives that can show this is a vulnerability and this is how it would have affected us had we not had these programs in place. So we're doing good. 
it rest it gives the uh, the executives that assurance, it gives them that peace of mind that yes, their vulnerability management programs are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're getting that return on investment. Yep. No, versus, agree with that. It's yeah. Versus yeah. the opposite of having your executives come to you and say, "Hey, I just read about this on name your news feed. What do you think about that?" And you're going, uh, "Give me a second while I Google that and see what's going on." Not yeah, you're doing. getting out in front. Definitely, definitely agree with that. See, we got a question or two in here on the chat. We'll come back to that in a second. I just had a couple points I wanted to add into things here before I'll, I'll throw that one at Denny and then offer my thoughts too, since I'm talking at the moment. But um, yeah, it's it's get, how do we get the information out there? And some of the points, uh, like Denny's raised some great points we need to be able to get out in front and that, but some of it even comes down to, are we actually presenting the information we need to about the program? Like, let's argue with metrics. Can I actually tie back and present the to the, to the audience in question the right level of information? So sure, we, one of the common things that people like to have from a metric perspective is the open and high, or high critical vulnerabilities that are out there. So the most important things inside the environment. But sending that for the organization matters to some people, but for a system administrator, send and having them have access to that data really doesn't matter that there's 256 critical vulnerabilities out there because none of these are related to me. So it's starting even to get better as we're breaking up and creating metrics that matter to the target audience. So the executives may care to understand what the overall risk is to the organization, but that system administrator, sure, they may be interested, but it doesn't help them do their job. Breaking it down so we can tailor the metrics, compartmentalize it and break it up into a meaningful data set for that individual. So open critical vulnerabilities inside the web um, servers, if that's their area of responsibility, or for the business unit owners as well. So for this business unit itself, let's argue with sales, what's happening in their part of the organization will help get more meaningful communications going and people start to realize the impact and benefit for them to pay attention to this and the program I find, because it is specific and it has meaning to them. So as we're dealing with some on the metric side there, starting getting that tailoring and compartmentalizing and getting better breakdown in essence of those metrics. So we're gonna be able to, hey, see, this is this is relevant to me. I don't care about anything. This, wow, this is all me. Holy Toledo, this is great. So having that also can help us get more buy-in in essence from the for the program side and ensuring we get better visibility and traction in the parts of our organization. So Jonathan, one mentioned... of the questions, oh, sorry, Danny, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off, my bad. Now you're talking oh, no. a lot about metrics. Um, can you give specific metrics or that, that could be useful you know, at various levels of maturity through an organization? Like let's say I'm mm -hmm. just starting off with a vulnerability management program. What could be my top metric that I want to start with versus, hey, I've got a mature program. What metrics should I be striving for? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, one of the comments I see posted up there just now out of uh, what uh, Dicky Discord's dailies, I think is what it was the last one. It's like the lecture in regards to the, um, uh, like how to make it, you have to make it tangible to the audience. So that comment, totally agree. We've got to get it and tie it into their, to their specific part of the organization. So starting out with, with some of our metrics, like I mentioned, the, the open critical vulnerabilities as an example of the metrics that could be useful for you. It's something we need to understand. And so when we're first starting out, we're going to have it for the organization. But from there, we might, uh, as we continue to progress, we'll start, I'd wanna see it start breaking it up on the different parts of the organization that I have to work with. Say it by the business unit. Maybe it's by the remediation effort people or parts of the organization. Maybe it's, as an example, break it up by the Linux systems related to the windows and our databases. However, you've got some groupings going on in your organization to get better focus. I also like another call, another metric that I like to measure, but it's not one a lot of people work on, I find, is what are we actually doing for closing out the vulnerabilities? And if we're just starting out with our program, it's helping us show, is the program actually having traction? Are we getting ahead? Even if it, we're not ahead from total vulnerabilities, it's showing we're making progress and there's some results that are coming from our vulnerability management program. So understanding that, yeah, in the past month, there's been 256 vulnerabilities that have been closed off out of the total number we have of say 2,500. 
choosing from a small organizational perspective, you can see at least, yeah, we're making progress. It's going to help our teams know, yeah, what we're doing matters instead of that number constantly growing as we're adding more and more assets into the mix uh, from as we're continuing to roll out the program and our asset inventory approves, just as a simple example. So those are some of the starting out metrics. I could probably go on about metrics all day if you want, asked and wanted me to, but I'm not gonna go there right now. But going into some of the more advanced metrics I like to see, tying into that closed vulnerability starts to get into the churn rate as an example. And this tends to happen with more mature organizations because your program needs to be there for a while. Plus I tend to have to have a more advanced program to get to this. And what we're meaning by churn is, what's coming in for the new vulnerabilities and then how am I actually keeping pace and the churn from my perspective tells me hey am I actually treading water am I getting ahead or am I overloaded and sinking here from a program perspective and it may not even be us directly in vulnerability management it could be we don't have the time from our remediation partners getting the work done but it can highlight and show program effectiveness and some of this ties back to the comment about knowing our audience that was uh, posted in here as well. It's because I want to see if there's a problem for my program with the churn, which goes to more senior leadership people compared to the system administrator. And I, I hate picking on the system administrator because they're great people, but it's just, they don't care about the churn there, but showing program effectiveness is how we can show what's going on to our leadership team. And so knowing the audience is where you want to target those as well. So I don't know, Denny, any you want to add on the metrics before we go to that one question that's over or the question where I said it started off and go over to? No, so one thing I do want to add is um, metrics are different for different levels of the organization. You know, we have our op operational metrics versus our executive metrics. Yeah. And we always kind of joke, you know, when we're talking to the executives, you want to keep it as simple as possible and get that, you know, Crayola box of eight colors so that you could, they can really understand it. Really, you only may only need the two colors, green and red. With you know, mm -hmm. when you're showing uh, reports to executives, green generally good, red generally bad. Because, like we said before, they just they want to get that return on investment. They understand the risks. And they understand you know the the key metrics, key performance indicators. You're not going to give a technical metric to an executive. That would just be the wrong target audience. Like we've talked before, keep it to your audience. Yeah. Where your operational metrics are showing more trending over time. So if you're just starting off, you're not going to have those initial operational metrics. But after three to six months, you'll be able to see the, those trends going either in a positive or negative direction. And then as we get into more mature metrics, maybe we can help determine why those trends are going the way they are. So, yeah, just making sure, like we've said before, know your audience and make sure you talk to your audience. Yeah. Trending. I'm a huge proponent of trending. I, I It tells me so much more about it than just that point snapshot in time. It shows me the history that's going with it. So definitely, if I can get trending done on a metric, I, I want it there. So I'm going to flip over to one of the questions we had come in there and I'm going to throw it at you, Denny, to put you on a bit on the spot and we'll see how this works. Uh, I know, I know. I mean that. That's why I wanted to say it as opposed to being answering it. Make him do all the hard work. Uh, anyways, the question that was in there was, how do we recommend compartmentalizing or breaking down large threats so that others can understand them? Is there any kind of strategies that you can use or do leverage to help us with the vulnerability management and get the understanding out there is at least what I understand from that question. And I think we'll end up seeing that up here on the screen just so everybody can see what was uh, directly asked. So yeah, so how do we compartmentalize it is, it's one of those asterisk type questions. It all depends on your organization. And I wish there was a clear straight answer, but it's really gonna depend on the, on the culture of your organization. How is your organization broken down? Are you siloed into web, web development teams? Are you siloed into your, your, your web server team, your database team, your server team? And, and you wanna break your vulnerabilities down to meet that organization. So for example, let's say we did have the database server and, and web teams. So as we're looking at our vulnerabilities, we want to put it in context for those teams. So that your, your let's say you're a web server team. All right, we, the vulnerabilities you need to address are X, Y, and Z that would address you know, what's been seen in your specific area because your web team may not necessarily care about the vulnerabilities that affect the database team and vice versa. Yeah. So being able to put it into the context for the team that's responsible for that mitigation is going to you know, be a big step in the right direction. So that would be my first suggestion is to break it down by your organizational teams. Um, 
my next suggestion would be, you know, break it down by using threat intelligence. Let's bring in some threat intelligence. And we may have, and I'm going to use basic numbers here, we may have 100 vulnerabilities. But of those 100 vulnerabilities we have on our systems, only, you know, let's say 25 of them are exploitable. But of those 25 that are, that are exploitable, only 10 of them are being actively exploited and that are in our environment. So instead of having our teams fix those 100 vulnerabilities or those 25 vulnerabilities, now they've only really got to focus on those 10 vulnerabilities that are actually the riskiest because it's actively being targeted in the wild and could affect our systems. And we may have some other defense and depth strategies that may even limit that even further to only five vulnerabilities. So again, instead of having to address those initial 100, using threat intelligence as it pertains to our environment, we've now narrowed that down to five. And that's a much more manageable number in the big scheme of things than 100. No, thank you for that, Denny. Hopefully that did answer the question that came in. If not, feel free to do a follow up on that. I got to take another one that came in here. It came in from John and it's asking us, uh, how does the vulnerability management roadmap and model convert to cloud solutions? The cloud only seems to be shown in the road in the cloud. It, it, it's a it seems to be a little bit there and not how it plays into the model. So first of all, uh, yeah, the vulnerability management maturity model, the VMMM, it is a uh, it, 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 lots of fun, lots of cool things. And we could spend an entire live broadcast probably talking about that too for hours. But what we have in there, it's giving us the general strategies and it's really not specific, quite frankly, to the cloud or to the enterprise. There are some aspects of the cloud though that we won't be able to do all of this in. So the enterprise and the our infrastructure as a service offerings that are out there primarily are in the same. So what you can do there are gonna be, it may be different tools, maybe different processes we follow, but getting access to the information or conducting those components, pick on policies. It, it doesn't matter where it is, I can create the policy. If I'm doing remediation, if it's a, a patch management process, I may be using a same tool, or maybe I'm using two different tools, one for cloud, one for enterprise and the infrastructure as a service offerings, but I can still get the remediation efforts done doing patch management to deal with the problems. So from that aspect, the vulnerability management maturity model does not play favorites between cloud or the traditional classic enterprise with racks and stacks of servers being cooled and we're playing with and wearing earmuffs to go into the rooms. Where it does start to get a little different is as we move up the um, different types of service offerings that are there. So the responsibility model, uh, if you've seen the one from um, AWS or from, um, Azure, they have it. We have one that we put out from the course as well. But as you move into things like the platform as a service or software as a service, we're passing that responsibility out to our vendors. It's what happens because infrastructure as a service, they're providing the power and the hardware, bare metal. We can layer the OS on top, any applications we want. They control access to the network to, through some aspects, but we also have the control there. When we say move on to platform, the operating system's gone. So some of the patch management processes we're not gonna be able to leverage or don't need to worry about because that we've outsourced to our vendor. And then when you move up into software as a service where we've taken everything almost quite frankly until we just get to the configuration of the endpoint software, access controls to the data and some of the settings in there, everything else is out to the vendor. So dealing with just sticking on the patching aspect, I have, very little responsibility associated with that anymore. So that component of the vulnerability management maturity model wouldn't be applicable if I'm dealing with software as a service, but it still would be applicable to me if I am dealing even with platform because I may have other items layered on top, definitely in the infrastructure and inside our enterprise. So with the vulnerability management model from that standpoint, it, it should be for the most part agnostic from the perspective of what you're using with that caveat of the type of service. So software as a service, I still have to worry about configuration management because I configure the software itself. So how do I understand and make sure everything's configured securely there? I still do that in platform. I still do it in infrastructure. I still do it in my enterprise. But as I said, some components we have removed and we're paying someone else and leveraging their expertise to be able to deliver it to us. So it should be able to be leveraged across either cloud or enterprise, but some components may end up being not as, or, or not even possible depending on your cloud offering that you're using. 
So hopefully that answers the question you have there, John. I see we have another question in two. Oh, this one I'll toss out. We can both tackle it, Denny. We'll see what's going on there. It's some yeah. active versus potential threats to lower the numbers to something more manageable, like that idea. So no, that, that wasn't a question. I just saw it, it popped up. I wanted to deal with it right away. So there you go. Good feedback on that. Thank you for that. So Jonathan, I'm going to tie into that statement. And where can we get the um, threat intelligence that we would need to help us determine what's an active versus potential threat? Oh. Where can we get those sorts of information from to help us, you know, help us again give that that breakdown? Yeah, no, that's a great thing, and this ties into the third question that we had on the into the model. Uh, or sorry, into the survey, not the I went off on vulnerability management model and stayed over there. Within the survey that we asked out there is, what are we leveraging for our, in our threat intelligence? So there's multiple sources that people are using and we saw in the results, like we had, what was it, uh, roughly 100, I'm just looking at my other screen here, just seeing the numbers, about 150 responses that came in and it's about, it's really a little, little less than statistically tied, but they were going across pulling it out of our vulnerability scanners, getting it from public other uh, our product sources. So a threat intelligent product itself could be getting it from industry. And you might even be leveraging things like blog posts, news articles and information like that. That's where we saw the top four sources in there. And those ranged from yeah, that about 22% is each one of those, give or take roughly, was what we saw in. And those were the top four that people were having in here. So if you're just starting out with vulnerability management, or sorry, you have vulnerability management, you want to start leveraging threat intelligence, best place I'd recommend for you to start with is use what's actually in the products. Maybe you like your vulnerability scanning products or the tools that we have available to us today. So as an example, you can, and you may have to pay some licensing for this in the product, it does depend on the vendor. But some of the, like all the vendors have it available. If you take a look inside Qualys, you do have access into threat intelligence. You can see information of whether it is, hey, is there an exploit available to this? Is, has it been out for more than 90 days? You can see this inside the Kenas and Brinkas as well of the world and getting access to the information about, is this something that is exploitable? So that some of that basic threat intelligence information, I think is probably the best place to start and leveraging the tools we have because it, it's, it's already there. We're already looking at those locations. And if we start taking that information into account, it's gonna help us advance and move our program a little bit forward because, hey, if I have two vulnerabilities, one over here, both of them CVSS score 10, let's keep it simple. Both of them, same CVSS score. What do I look at? Both of them are have five, uh, quantity five of these inside my environment. One's exploitable, one isn't. One has a vulnerable, like one has the exploit that's out there. It's in a it's in a ransomware kit. It's currently actively being used. It's being told by the tools, I should probably take and take a look at that one before I take a look at the one that does not have the known exploits for it. And we can get that information, some of the basic threat intel stuff that's coming to us from our tools. So that's where I'd recommend for people to start. And then if you want to carry on in advance from there, then you were probably going into some of the dedicated threat feeds, potentially getting in either uh, threat intelligence products, or we're getting access to some of the feeds and doing our own data fusion on the back end to try and merge it with the data, our vulnerability data, our asset data, the context of our organization and getting the, and doing that fusion ourselves. So there are some tools that can help us, or we can do it in our back end data lakes, data warehouse, I heard recently or saw in a Gartner uh, report, it was like, yeah, they're actually calling things. It's not just a data lake and a data warehouse out there. You can actually have a lake house now. <laughs> Who knew I can have the cottage sitting out there for me inside my, my data repository in the back end of the organization, whatever. But that's where I'd recommend and suggest you probably start moving forward with from the, the threat intelligence side from my perspective. And that's, that's where the easiest way to start leveraging it inside your organizations today. I don't know, Denny, anything you wanted to add on that one? So, yeah, I know uh, we've talked about, you know, automatic threat and tell feeds and having the ability to ingest that data and merge that data into like our vulnerability management programs and asset management. Uh, one thing that I wouldn't discredit totally is, is blog sources. Being able, you know, when you come in in the morning, the first thing you grab your cup of coffee or, you know, drink of choice and sit down and, and look at some of the top blogs that are coming out, whether it be from your own vendors or from, you know, your competitors vendors look and see what's out there and kind of cross-reference it against each other. 
because you'll start to see trends if you if you read multiple log sources you know over a period of time that trending analysis again you'll start to see d different trends come out and you'll you know you'll start to see that those issues that bubble to the top so to speak and you know you may be able to get some insight into that as to what's going on mm -hmm. um so yeah there, there's also there's the automatic threat intel but there's also that that human intel that you get from you know just reading the blog sources and don't discredit bob from accounting he may know something <laughs> yes yeah, so I, I did like that on the threat intelligence we actually did have the response for yeah. someone that came in and said bob from accounting was their source for threat intelligence i thought that was great too to actually threw that in there for fun and that who knew we were actually knew? right the bob was giving it to somebody uh, <laughs> it's a great thing from that perspective um <laughs> I, yeah, Bob from accounting. He's, he, I, I'm going to be using that anytime I teach now. Bob from accounting <laughs> would be a great source of information. It's kind of like when I was teaching at another class. It's a we have a, a scenario inside the course, and it's it's just one of the characters in there. Everyone wanted to now be him because hey, he's retiring in six months. So hey, let's just be Fred. So it was Fred, a joke for the rest Fred. of that class. Let's just be Fred. So um, I won't get into that. We don't have time for that. But um. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm going to sit here and laugh, Eddie. I'm going to ask you a question, though. Sure. Uh, with regards to policies and procedures, how do they help us and what kind of role do they play for us inside vulnerability management? What, what are your thoughts on that one? Oh, policies and procedures. Everybody loves policy procedures. We all love to sit and write those out and make sure they're all thorough and we keep them up to date. Everybody throw their <laughs> thumbs up there. We keep them up to date, right? Of course, that's what we were supposed to do. That's the, I have all the time in the world to make sure they're up to date. Exactly. <laughs> I, and I know we kind of look at them as like that necessary evil. You know, when audit comes around, we're scrambling to find the policies. Does this policy address that? Can we make the checkbox it for audit? Yes and no, but our policy should work for us. You know, our policy should be an outline of, of what we want to do in our organizations and our procedures should give us the guidelines of how to achieve those policies. Um, another thing that we want to make sure that our policies address is permissions. Do you have the permission within your organization to do the scanning, to do that vulnerability assessment, to probe somebody's system? And then how does that change when we go to the cloud? Do you have permissions when you all of a sudden have a software as a service or infrastructure as a service? Do you have those permissions and are they outlined in your policy? And do your procedures allow for that? So th those policies and procedures, although they are the necessary evil, I mean, we got to have them. They can also protect us. They can also, you know, allow us to do the jobs that we need to do. But we do want to make sure we keep them up to date, as difficult as that may be. Take the time. Again, we got to make this goes back to one of the very first points we had today. We need to make time. Take that, you know, time once a quarter, once every six months and look at those vulnerability management policies and make sure that they are actually in line with what we're doing. Because the last thing we want is to have a policy that says we're going to address all critical vulnerabilities in five, from five days of release. Sounds great on policy. It looks good on paper for somebody writing that out. But let's look at our practice. What are we actually doing? Are we only addressing those critical vulnerabilities and we our cycle is two weeks from release? Well, we're never going to meet the policy. So why does our policy say that? So let's make sure our policies are in line with our practices so that you know we're not setting our teams up for failure, we're actually setting them up for success. So yeah, maybe great on paper to start to address that within five days. But if we're not doing it with it, if we're taking two weeks to do it, let's make our policy say two weeks. We're not lowering the bar, we're setting the bar for where we're at. And then we can, as we improve and mature our processes, then we can move that bar accordingly. So we're not setting ourselves up for failure, but we set ourselves up for success. No, so that's, that's a great, great point. point. Oh, sorry, Denny. Oh, sorry, Denny. No, you're good. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I think that's a great point in regards to making sure that what we can achieve inside the organization, remediation timeframes are achievable for us within regards to the program as opposed to, as you said, like set it up and it has to be done in five days, but my process is over less easy than two weeks. That just won't work. And, work, and, work. and he said, we're all setting, we're all setting, setting, setting those realistic remediation time frames. Time frames. It's, it's a huge problem a lot of organizations have. And it's not just it's organizations. Not organizations. organizations. Yeah. 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 Your, your audio went early garbled on this air for a second. So I'm not sure what happened there. It sounds really staticky. And we do apologize oh, for that for oh, anybody else who may have heard that. One second. One second. Let me. 
So yeah, while you're adjusting that, I'm gonna look at one of the comments that just came in. Um, so bear with me just a minute. And Phil Cavan asks, what are the key vulnerability management KRIs and metrics to track and stay ahead of the change threat landscape? What truly represents the risk to the business? Phil, I wish I could give you a straight answer to that one. Unfortunately, sometimes what happens is it's going to be answered with the asterisks. It depends. What's your organization and what's your risk? Like we said before, if you're a large you know, company that has a very large public presence, maybe you're an online retailer, your, your key metrics may be the uptime of your web servers and how you're able to address that. Um, if you are a call center, maybe your uptime, maybe your metrics are, you know, your call center uptimes and how your vulnerability management plays into that. If you have vulnerabilities that take your systems down, that's going to be a bad thing. So maybe we want to be able to have metrics that measure those sort of things. Jonathan, are we back? Uh, let's see if we are back. I changed my audio source. Am I good or am I horrible? You sound much better now. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm glad for that. I apologize. I, uh, I did change my audio, and if I need to, I'll kick my kids offline completely and tell them to <laughs> stop playing games for the next 20 minutes or however long we go for. So <laughs> I apologize for that. It's uh, the joys we all have to deal with now. Apparently, my bandwidth is being overly flexed here at the house at the moment. So we're uh, really in issues. We're tied. <laughs> Uh, it, it happens sometimes. But um, one thing I saw in an interesting comment that was up here was, was Mr. Mo was with, uh, it's in regards to uh, what are our thoughts out uh, for how, what are the thoughts to what to look out for when considering vulnerability management processes for APIs? And really, that, <laughs> we've got a few minutes left here, but that's actually a really great question. I'll, but what we have, there's really two flavors of the APIs we're going to have to worry about and deal with here. But the first one is going to be APIs that we create as part of code inside our organization. So we actually have full control of that development process. So we should be able to do all the scanning that we want and have available to us as part of our code development processes, be it our static code scanning, doing dynamic testing on those inside the non-production environments. So I have a lot of flexibility, availability about what's going on there. I can force using some standardized uh, APIs that are available to us. I can force secure coding practices as to whatever it is for the information we, we want to expose for us coding in there. So we, have, we can put some good controls around those. But the other type of API that we have to deal with, yeah, those are the ones that are exposed to us from products that we either have in our environments or even in the cloud, the API exposure for us querying out into our AWS, our GCP, our Azure environments for everything from the login or our command line interfaces we're using to tap in, or am I using my third party tools in order to orchestrate and deploy my environments? But I don't have the control around those APIs at the source code level. It's, it's there in the product. I may be able to turn it on and off, but that's a completely different set from where we end up having to look at it and have access to the source code. So source code, we've got lots of testing methodologies. We should be able to apply and deal with them there. The exposed APIs that we don't own and don't have the control over, that's where we have to potentially, you know, there's several options we can do here. One, hope the vendor fixes it. Um, but yeah, we know that that can take time coming out to us from the vendors. The second thing, we're, another approach we're going to have to look at is those compensating controls to put the wrappers around it. Where are we exposing the APIs? Who's allowed to get through to communicate with them? That can be done from a firewalling type perspective, access control list, firewall, um, whatever you want to call it, but restrict the access so it's only coming down from known good sources and putting uh, things like our multi-factor authentication if they're available to us so that we can't either spoof addresses, things like there's lots of attack mechanisms. But if I'm able to actually get some of that in place and put those compensating controls trying to restrict the API exposure for us, that's going to help and ensure that we're it's at least not wide open to the world, like the equivalent of, yeah, let's just put a server out on the internet and see what happens to it. Let's at least structure, architect our environment, and use some of the tools we have available to us to try and restrict access into those APIs and leverage things like multi-factor authentication 
Yeah, it can be a pain. I think I have three different authentication tools on my smartphone to help me log into the variety of websites out there. It's better than having the 17, I'm old enough to have had the secure ID tokens, those little fobs we all had to carry around. Yeah, when you had the fleet of those, yeah, that was a pain. At least here, it's just an app on my phone. But leveraging that to ensure at least we're taking advantage of the security configurations and options available to us, it's gonna make it a lot harder for people to be able to take advantage of what we have exposed in those APIs. I don't know, Denny, any confidence you have on that one? No, I think that was a great explanation. And one thing I want to loop back to, if we can, why you had your audio issues. Uh, Phil had a question about some of the uh, KRIs and metrics to track and stay ahead of the changing threat landscape. I want mm -hmm. to know what truly represents a risk to the business. I kind of started answering that when we jumped back in and kind of changed focus. So I did want to go back to Phil's question. So are there metrics that we can use to stay ahead of the, of the threat landscape? Oh, I'm going to put me on the spot now. God, yeah, love that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Representing the risk to the business. Like you said, you want those key risk indicators and you're rolling it up because you're going to be going and probably presenting this type of information up to the executive levels. So it is understanding what is the comprehensive risk from a, what you understand from the program perspective. So starting out, that may be as basic and information as what do we have for the critical vulnerabilities inside our environment? That's going to have a known quantity of risk associated with it. And if we're just starting out, that may be all I'm going to be able to provide from an informational perspective. But as we continue to mature, I'd actually want to start breaking up both the, the metrics, as I mentioned, by business units, so I can start to see the risk in business units because that's gonna help some of the rest of the leadership team know where the problems are. But overall in the company, I do want to understand what do I have for my um, remediation timeframes as an example, another performance indicator. How long is it taking me to actually remediate risk? What are my closure times? When is it from the, um, the mean time to resolve? So when it, from when I find it to when I resolve it, I want to know mean time to detect inside my organization. So from when it's publicly released to when I know it's there. And some of you are probably thinking at the moment, well, I'm using agents. Yeah, but are you using agents everywhere inside the environment? That may help and be work on your, your Windows system, your Linux systems. I can query in through the cloud APIs to grab access about all those data fairly quickly. But there's lots of devices that we can't put them, uh, the agents onto. So understanding what's my mean time to detect and resolve for those non-agent available devices, your peripherals, the, the routers, the switches, your IoT, your ICS devices, all of those that I have to do some other sort of method of detection is going to help me tie into the risk. Because if I know it, it takes me four days till I know everything inside my organization, what's there? That's huge from understanding if oh, it's 20 days. When I was first starting out, we were actually only doing things non-agent based. We were doing authenticated scans. I was on a six week cycle from the PCs to be able to scan across the entire organization. That's how it got up, set up based on the timeframes, number of devices, et cetera. So I couldn't confirm a risk was there or that a risk was remediated for up to six weeks in some parts of the environment if I was solely using my vulnerability scanning tool. We looked at alternatives, just in this case, of things like leveraging the SCCM, or the WUS at the time, uh, but leveraging other tools that can help me query more quickly because of how they're communicating inside my environment. So those are the kind of indicators I'd say to help us understand the risk. It's not just what the exposure is. How long does it take me to find the exposure? How long does it take me to actually remediate the problems in my environment. And I, if I have trending, I can see hopefully that this is improving over the 12 month period. It used to take us 50 days, we're down to 43. You can see we're getting better at capturing and dealing with the risk and remediating them faster in the environment. So that's my thoughts on that one. So Jonathan, I know we're tight on time. We're coming up to the top of the hour. I just want to give one shout out to Mr. Mo. Fobs do still exist. <laughs> Oh, the fob days. God, I'm glad I don't have to worry about keeping the pocket full of fob. So I guess one last question for you, Danny. Sure. How's the Jeep coming? How's the Jeep coming? What have you been doing on it? 
Oh, so it's a it's a long slow process. So quick uh, history. I uh, I recently my daughter and I recently discovered a 1981 CJ5 in a barn and took possession of it. And we started the restoration project and it has been a very slow process, as one can imagine, from a vehicle that's been sitting for 15 years. But it's also very rewarding. Her and I get to work on it together. So that's been probably the highlight of the entire process. And I did learn that a Jeep does need brakes to stop. <laughs> No, that's what trees were invented for. You throw the winch out the window and hope it wraps around good enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, you got to make it work. Anyways, as you said, we are at the top of the hour with the hour booked here. So, A, I want to say thank you, Denny, for coming in today, helping me answer all these questions. I also want to say thank you to everybody who tuned in here, be it live or if you're going to watch it later. Thank you for doing that. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. You see, both Denny and I, we've got our Twitter handles on there. Feel free to reach out through there. However you want to try and get in touch with us, go right ahead. We'll see if we can help answer some further questions. So thank you for taking the time being part of this today, and we will see you in the future.